right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Jennifer Chapman, who is in Indianapolis, Indiana. How are you doing, Jen? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and, and Jennifer is the founder of Ambition Leadership. Um, and, uh, and part of what you do is, uh, you know, you do a lot of emotional intelligence and, and, and uh, helping people understand how they operate in, in different environments. Before we get into that, though, tell me, why is it important for people to understand the dimensions that you measure? Well, I've noticed that people tend to focus on their competency in whatever area of expertise they've decided to go into. So you've got a really smart engineer, a very talented plumber, or a very skilled teacher. And if you only focus on your cognitive intelligence, you're missing actually the most important factor in how successful you're going to be. Uh, Daniel Goleman, who's the expert in emotional intelligence, said actually the best predictor of success in the workplace is emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And those are all the people skills and the soft skills that a lot of times we just say, oh, I don't have time for that, or I don't really care if people like me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it can have, it could certainly have impact on your career and moving up. Oh, I don't for sure. I agree 100%. And I think, uh, and I've had this conversation before with some people, but I think we did ourselves a massive disservice when we uh, named it soft skills, because mm -hmm. it just, I mean, if ever there was a thing that uh, when the going gets tough, the people go, oh, well, let's chuck the hot soft skills stuff. That's all nice to have. But the reality is that uh, as good as you are, how you interact with the world, with your work colleagues, with the world in general, impacts your ability to deliver, you know, results. Absolutely. Especially, I found one big obstacle I found a lot of people encountering in the workplace is getting buy-in. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you might have the best idea ever. And I actually, my husband is an engineer. And so we laugh all the time because he gets free coaching and I get a free person to practice on. <laughs> One time he, he came home from work. He was fairly new in the company, but you know, mid-level as far mm -hmm. as the hierarchy goes. And he came home and he told me that he was so frustrated because he was trying to pitch this new software that was so much better than the one that they'd been using. And he said, I brought it up and everybody just immediately shot it down and door closed. And he's like, I can't believe that they wouldn't even. And I said, well, tell me a little bit more about how you approached it. And he said, well, I went in and I said, hey, the program you guys are have been using is archaic and it's clunky and it's this and that. And there's this other one and it's gonna be so much better for X, Y, and Z. and and." I don't think anybody heard past the program, uh, the software you have is archaic. <laughs> the mm, guards yeah. went up and people didn't want to hear. And so, you know, for somebody who says, well, I'm just a direct person, that's just how I am. Mm -hmm. That may be true. But if you really want to have an impact, if you really want people to listen to your ideas, you've got to be able to relay what your idea is in a way that people will receive it, not get defensive about it and have a lot of data and facts behind it so people can see why you think it's a great idea. Yeah, and ultimately people believe conclusions they come to themselves over anything you can say to them. So in many ways, what you have to do is figure out how to deliver a message that they can then take and reconstruct themselves and go, okay, this makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's, it, 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 is, it is interesting. And I think that's where, uh, if people want to, again, an example of why this is important. I think that's where a lot of things get derailed is in the communication, uh, obviously. And therefore, being able to interact or understand how you interact with, with people and with the world is, is an important thing. And because people receive information differently, receive everything you do in different ways, you, you have to be aware of that. Exactly. And I think you know, one thing I like about one of the tools I use for emotional intelligence is it draws attention to different aspects of emotional intelligence that you might not have thought about before. Um, for example, assertiveness. And I work with a lot of 
people who don't have enough assertiveness and I work with them about getting more confident and about, you know, putting their ideas on the table, mm -hmm. collaborating with others. But then sometimes you have people with way too much assertiveness and it becomes arrogance. And then yeah. I'm helping people dial it back so that they can be more approachable, mm -hmm. listen more to other people. Um, and then another area that I see a lot right now in the workplace is um, a dichotomy between like people with really strong interpersonal relationships who are excellent at collaborating. And then you've got other people who would prefer to and actually probably work better independently. And in this mm -hmm. day and age, you've got to be able to do both. Yeah, you yeah. And, uh, no, I, I think I think that's a key point here, because, yes, you have to be able to do both. And I think that sometimes, uh, you know, like you said, people gravitate towards which one they're more comfortable with. Often, you know, some people like to work independently, some people like to work collaboratively. But you've got to be able to do, as you say, you've got to be able to do both. And you've got to be able to pivot from one to the other, because when you're working independently, you have to drive yourself. But when you're working in a collaborative group, you have to help the group drive itself. Yes. And you've got to know how to motivate people and how to stay accountable to each other. There's a lot of complexity there. And I think, you know, part of, I think what's happened is in our education system, especially in colleges, we're seeing a lot more of group projects, a lot more of collaborative efforts. And then the downside then is I think you get people who've emerged out of that into the workplace who are dependent on other people being, a, being more skilled than them in other areas. And it's okay because you're all working together, mm -hmm. but then they have underdeveloped skills in some of that assertiveness or kind of being able to be a jack of all trades, which I think in every job, there's an aspect of needing to do more than yeah. besides the the one thing that you love to do. Yeah, and I think it's interesting about the whole working independently thing because I think people are gotten, getting so used nowadays to collaborating, to being in constant contact with people, to, to be interacting, social media, all of this, that it's almost like when somebody comes to have to do something on their own and they, and they need to maybe isolate themselves a little bit, shut out all of these things, they struggle with that because they're not used to doing it. Yes, and we've absolutely seen that come to a head this past year with us all of a sudden having to work remotely. And even I worked remotely already, but even di other dynamics shifted for me. And I think that there are people who have thrived working by themselves in this pandemic and their independence factor has gone up and they've done a great job. I think other people, it's been tremendously stressful to work by themselves and feel really isolated. And maybe they don't have all of the technical skills they needed to be as independent as we've had to be. I work with a couple of bosses right now who are frustrated with some employees that like several times a day are reaching out I am phone calls and any other way they can get attention and need a lot of handholding throughout the mm -hmm. day to complete tasks. And it's really been a time, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like a time suck to have yeah. these people. Um, Cause especially if you've got a boss who's got multiple people who are needing that handholding. So there's a line between you, you want to ask for help. That's a good thing. But then you've mm -hmm. also got to figure out how could work independently. And, you know, I'm an extrovert, as you can tell, I just keep talking. Um, and I think one tip I have for those who are extroverted, who maybe can work independently, but they don't like to, find other ways to feed the extroversion. Maybe you have a virtual lunch with somebody every day, or you plan a, a group call at the beginning of the day or the end of the day that you can look forward to. Find other ways to get that extroversion need met and then you're not going to be so needy on the things throughout the business day. Yeah. And I think that goes vice versa, too, is if you're particularly introverted, too, is maybe you need to uh, actually force some for some interaction. But I think this is a really I think I think you touched on something to hear that's really important. And, um, and and Jennifer uses this tool um, that's called if my memory serves me right. It's um, the EQI. It's um, 
a, a report that uh, you know you do an assessment and all of that kind of good stuff and then it gives you all these different dimensions from self-perception self-expression interpersonal decision making stress management etc and um, with emotional intelligence as the center of it and why I think this is important today is just from what you said, I think we've entered a different environment for work. I mean, a lot of it's done remote and virtual now. Companies are having to reorganize themselves. Companies are having to pivot because of what's happened with the pandemic. There's so much change in flux that I think now is a time when people really need to understand how they interact with the world. Yes, and one thing I really like about this tool is everybody comes out with some strengths and everybody comes out with some areas where they're lower. And what I can do as a coach is I help people see, it's really hard to tell somebody to stop doing something or start mm -hmm. doing something, but when we can balance out a self, a part of the emotional intelligence with another part of emotional intelligence, then it gets a little easier to put it into practice. For example, yeah. if I get somebody who's like overly independent and maybe on the aggressive side of assertiveness, then we work on those interpersonal skills and having empathy for other people. And then as you start putting yourself in other people's shoes and start listening more to what their ideas are, their needs are, it's naturally going to balance out that independence and assertiveness. Because yeah, I think a lot of the times as people don't don't realize the impact of certain ways that they operate, even uh, and I'm not saying that in a negative context, sometimes it can be positive. Sometimes you don't know that some of your your skills or your way of operating are actually really good. And if you even paid more attention to it, you could be even more successful. And likewise, maybe some are having a, a, a negative impact. And I think that's the problem is people don't really understand a lot of these a lot of the impacts of these things. Therefore, um, taking some time out to actually study it and understand it gives you the power to be able to leverage it better. Yes, you want more self-awareness. And then as your self-awareness increases, then your ability to manage that becomes so much easier. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned self-awareness because I do think, and I can honestly say, I think um, lack of self-awareness is the greatest inhibitor to success in work and to be honest success in life as well and therefore i mean i would really encourage people uh, to to look at the tool that, that jennifer has and to do it do a coaching session because um with her because as i said anything that helps you increase your self-awareness is going to exponentially help your work life your your private life everything because that is a, throughout my career that is the one thing i have seen really hold people back is lack of self-awareness and also and it's a difficult thing make no mistake you know when you go through the process of becoming a, a more self-aware you have to have some hard conversations with yourself absolutely but it's easier to have hard conversations with yourself than hearing it from somebody else and it's a really awkward thing to give feedback on um mm -hmm. and and i know some bosses who and supervisors who brave, are brave enough to try but like you said just helping somebody discover it themselves is so much more powerful than hearing someone else say, hey, you need to pay attention to this more. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's really hard to tell somebody they're they're lacking in self-awareness. It's just like when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I want to, this is the job I want. I want this job. And you're looking at them and you're going, oh my goodness, you're the most unsuited person to that. And they're <laughs> telling you why they should have this job. And there's a huge disconnect between their perception of themselves and your perception of them. And, and I think, yeah. So I think the more you can go through a process like this, the, the, the better it is because it would really stand to you. And again, I think, um, Jennifer, the whole idea of emotional intelligence as well is, I think somehow that again has gotten a little bit lost um, because it's been bandied about so much. Oh, you have to have emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence, emotional, and and people don't really understand the fundamentals of it. I would agree with that completely. And you know, I, all I see a lot of companies do is, you know, they have like this one hour training on <laughs> emotional intelligence, yeah. and then everybody goes back to their desks and you know, well, check, we, we did yeah. that. Or, or, and, pe or people or people like, um, you know, go, oh, emotional intelligence, oh, Southwest Airlines, so I just have to be funny. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it takes, it takes some time, it takes some attention to make it a priority. 
But I found as I've increased my own emotional intelligence, it's easier for me to navigate the different relationships that I have. And we all have multiple people mm -hmm. in our personal lives. And then of course at work, and there are always people that are easier to get along with than others. And I think just as I've gotten more aware of my preferences and how I work, then I can see, oh, that's why I clash with so and so okay and now i can figure out what to do about that yeah and i think that's where the huge benefit is is that you can figure out uh number one obviously areas in yourself and that but you can also say okay i can see how i can this person and myself are not going to see eye to eye if i approach it in the normal way i have to approach things differently or i have to dial back on this a little bit because of who they are i mean it just really it really does give you um, tools to be able to navigate those those interpersonal relationships. Yes. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of different people. And one time I worked with someone who had been fairly successful in the workplace, was middle management, approaching senior management at the organization. And there, uh, the company was putting all of the people at that level through coaching. And that's how he became my client. And as I started talking to him and we did a couple of assessments together, he just kept saying, well, that's other people's perception. That's their problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you that, like, I mean, it was really kind of funny because at the end of his coaching engagement, he, the feedback he gave to his HR was, yeah, it was nice, but it wasn't really life-changing. And, it, you know, that came back to me and I was like, of course it wasn't because he wasn't open to it. He was just dismissive and well, I, I'm not going to change. And if that's how you feel, then I'm not going to try to change your mind, yeah. but you also have to accept the consequences that come with that. And you might be missing out on other opportunities yeah. or relationships that could really catapult your career in a whole new place. Yeah, no, it's like that when, whenever, and we've all been guilty of, the, of it in the past, I'm sure of, you know, that's just what I'm like, you know, I'm just like that. Uh, and then you have to take a step back and you go, yeah, but maybe being like that is, isn't very good. And it's not serving you and it's not serving other people. So maybe you have to change. And I think that's it. And I think that always comes from a place of like defensiveness and fear, obviously, because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the person you're talking about there probably took it as, as, oh, I see these are all criticisms of me, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand my ground. This is who I am, et cetera. Um, and I just think it's good. It's just good to open up and look at things. And as I said, become, become more self-aware, but also understand the way you you operate, where it serves you well and where it doesn't serve you well. I mean, those th seems like pretty common sense thing to do. Absolutely. And I think one question uh, the audience can ask themselves right now is, do I have more of a victim mentality? Do things happen to me? Do I feel like I don't have a whole lot of control in my life and my work? Or do you feel like you are in charge and that you're empowered and that you are really in control to make your life what you want it to be or your job what you want it to be? And for those who think, yeah, I, you know, I think I tend to point the finger at others or blame it on circumstances. Mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity for you to pause and ask, is that serving you? Because let me tell you, we all have so much more control of our lives than I think we even realize it's it's daunting almost when you get mm -hmm. that vision of what you can change but i'm here to tell you in my personal life and in the lives of so many people i've worked with it's truly incredible what you can start out with and then have a path towards mm -hmm. and if you're that kind of a person then coaching can just be a powerful um, ignition for what's next in your life yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And it always reminds me of that uh, story, Wayne Dyer, the, the self-help guru who passed a couple of years ago. He, he He's mentioned a story about walk. I think he lived in Fort Lauderdale or somewhere like that, but walking on the beach one evening and he met this, bumped into this woman and she asked him, she said, oh, do you live here? And he said, yes. And she, he was, why? And he said, well, we're moving here from Chicago or somewhere. And she said, I'm just wondering what are the people like here? and uh, you know neighbors and all that and he said he asked her, he said well what were they, what were they like or what are they like where you live right now in chicago and she said well you know they're very kind of closed off they're not very friendly um you know 
all that kind of gossip, all that kind of thing. And he said, well, they're exactly the same here. And the, what his point was, was that that's what she, that was her expectation and that's what she was going to actualize. Ooh. That's a great and I, story. It is, isn't it? And I think that's the point is, um, unless you realize how you perceive the world, how you interact with the world or whatever, um, then the world is going to serve you up what you perceive and how you actualize it and all of that. And until you realize that, you're not going to be able to have any impact on it. I love it. I love what you just said. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you know, as, as we come to the end of our uh, interview here, um, Jennifer, please do tell people a little bit more about your, your tool and how they can leverage it and what it can do for them. Yeah, so um, th this is the Emotional Intelligence Assessment, the EQI 2.0, and it has different composites of emotional intelligence and that it breaks them down into sub, sub uh, elements of EQ. And what I find valuable is it draws attention to all these different components. It highlights how you compare to an, um, another population of professionals. And then you can see, okay, these are the areas where I'm really strong. Here are some areas where I'm not as strong. Here are some things that might be at odds with each other. Like maybe I accomplish a lot, but it's not really translating into a healthy sense of self-esteem. And then we can talk about you know, how to build up those lower areas and how to use that newfound awareness to then impact your life and what you want it to be. And one thing I find that's really fun about this tool is it will apply as much to your personal life as it will to your work life. And as you work on the different areas in one part of your life, you will see it impact the other mm -hmm. areas as well. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, I've been using it for years and i um, just have really loved it. And for your audience, if anybody would be interested in taking the assessment, I am offering a special for this podcast audience. And if you go to my website at www.ambitionleadership.com, right on the homepage, you can select either have a complimentary consultation with me or you can go ahead and sign up to take this emotional intelligence tool at a very discounted rate and have a 30 minute debrief session with me about how to take the results and put them into something actionable in your life. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and just to um, let everybody know, I've taken this test myself and just done a brief debrief with Jennifer. And I really highly recommend it. I think given the last year or so, we've been through so many changes a, a vortex of emotions and all of that. I think this is probably the best time you will ever have to do something like this and kind of set yourself up for the future because uh, I think going forward, emotional intelligence is obviously going to continue to be and grow in importance, but also just managing ourselves in this in this world of change and flux, the more tools you can give yourself, the more awareness you can have, I think it's incredibly important. Yes. And, you know, 2021, I think, has already dashed a little bit of hope for it being a better year. And who knows, we've still got a long time ahead of us. Yeah. But it, with all the things that are outside of our control, this is one thing that is absolutely in your control. And, yeah. and it's kind of fun to have something positive you can set your eyes on and, OK, well, maybe this and this and this is going on. But I can work on improving this. And I tell you, as you improve your emotional intelligence, the doors will open for greater visibility in your workplace. Those of you who maybe got laid off or um, furloughed or whatever in your current employment, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. And while you're job hunting, you know, work on that, those emotional intelligence skills because that absolutely is going to set you apart from your competition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, listen, thanks very much, Jennifer, for today. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. All of Jennifer's information will be below this video. Please do check it out. Go take the test. Uh, and I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.